So today we hear very, very little about the uh, temptations of Jesus in the desert. Uh, Mark says um, about as, as little about it that could possibly be said. He said uh, he was tempted by Satan. That's kind of it. That's all we get from Mark. So today we're going to have to turn to uh, Matthew just for a little more detail, uh, just so we know what happened, because otherwise I'd, I'd be presuming that you know what the temptations were, which you probably do. But just to recap, uh, uh, so Matthew writes, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Okay, so that's Matthew's version, a lot more detail than we we got from from Mark. No offense to Mark, but we just just need a little more if we're going to meditate it today. So the three temptations. Very, very important to see how temptation works. Uh, The temptations get uh, progressively more sinister, progressively more serious, okay? So it starts with something relatively innocuous. Jesus is hungry. I mean, bless, if I skip one meal, um, I could be described as maybe a little hangry, I think is the term that's used today. Uh, So, you know, hunger, angry. Um, So you just skip one meal. But imagine like three, four days, five days, six days, 10 days, 20, 40 days, genie. That's, that's tough going. Okay, so 40 days, and, and the scripture is very clear. St. Matthew is very clear. He was famished, okay? So Satan waits till you're weak. He waits till you're weak. So he waits till you have some sort of a, a distraction, if there's something going wrong in your life, there's something hard, some, some difficulty. And that's when he will just sinisterly slide in with his serpentine semantics <laughs> and, uh, and begin to hiss in one's ear. Okay, now what he actually hisses here isn't as I say, isn't that bad, but there's something, there's something important that we have to recognize in this. You know, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread, right? So if you are as smart or as powerful as you think you are, show it. You know, prove yourself, okay? Uh, there's another temptation in this, and this is the temptation of uh, priorities, okay? Not everything that Satan tempts us to is a sin, that's an interesting statement. Okay. So not everything that Satan tempts us to is a sin. But he will often tempt us to do what's second best, or third best, or fourth best. He, won't tempt, he will never tempt us to do what's best. He'll never tempt us to do to fulfill our vocation, God's plan, whatever that is. Anything less than that is sufficient for him. I mean, if he can get you to drop to priority number 10, absolutely fine. But anything less than one is fine. So God's will for you is that you marry this person here. God, Satan's will for you is that you marry anyone else or don't get married at all. Or God's will for you is that you become uh, a priest. Now, if that's, if that's God's call, if that's what God's plan for your life, and some way, like this is the deepest desire of your heart as well, Satan's desire is that you do anything else. Just do anything else. Or even like the simple things at home uh, to get our pri- priorities right, okay? You know, there's a a busy home, three kids all under the age of five, nappies flying everywhere, okay? And the husband decides, love, I'm going to clean out the garage. And so he goes out to the garage and he gets his spanner, it's a size 15 spanner that should go after the size 14 spanner, we'll just hang that there. You know, makes no difference at all. There is chaos in the house, okay? The wife needs you to bathe the child, wash, feed, 
the other 17 of them, right, while stopping little Johnny from setting the furniture on fire, take the dog out because you just have to wet in the carpet, okay? That's, that, that's, the, that's priority number one. Hold your family together. The garage can wait, okay? So, like, this is how Satan works. Like, anything, anything except the main priority. Just do anything else. So, we, we have here, like, we have time for prayer, for example. Oh, I, I suppose I should clean my room. Please do clean your rooms, but not during prayer time. Right? Or then, that's why religious life always from the, from the beginning, like, ad ora et labora, prayer and work, in order to not exaggerate one or the other. Now, don't spend all of your time working if you become a, a lay brother or a missionary priest or whatever it is. You don't just work yourself into the ground till you die. Um, you have to actually pray as well. So we should pray and work, pray and work. If you spend all of your time hiding in the chapel away from real work and real mission and real people with their imperfections, you're using prayer to escape. No, prayer and work, prayer and work, prayer and work. Keep both together. Okay, so that's, again, it's a subtle temptation to not put our, our priorities in the right order and to prioritize in things that aren't important. Maybe, like, for example, you know, kids need your time more than your money. This, this one is difficult to, to say because you have to see it written, but they need your presence more than your presence. I'm not sure if you picked that up. The second one is the Christmas one. Okay, they need your presence being there more than your Christmas presents. They need your presence more than your presence. Okay. Uh, so God, will, God will, will, will be inspiring us to, to, to spend time with our family. The enemy will encourage us, tempt us, to spend time with anything else, anything, anyone else, even doing good things. Another very popular thing today, uh, two things that are quite politically correct today, for example, is um, when it comes to, to getting our priorities wrong, to put, we'll say, uh, something like environmental issues and issues of freedom over God's will and obedience to him. So like the, the, the like number one commandment here uh, these days is, you know, save the environment. By all means, we, we should save the, help the environment and recycle and all that kind of thing, yes. Faithfulness to God is first though. So faithfulness to God and his will, his plans, his prayer, you know, prayer to him, all the honor and glory due to him, that's first. The environment comes, you know, it's their life, but it's down number six or seven, you know. Uh, I had a friend uh, who I lived with in college and um, adamantly pro-choice, adamantly pro-choice. But woe to you if you ever harmed an animal. You know, just if you harmed a cat or a dog or not that we would ever do it deliberately, like, but you know what I mean? You know, a cat dies in the road, it happens, like, what, what are you going to do? Uh, but, like, she'd be distraught. But... Absolutely no problem. Abortion, all nine months, absolutely. No problem at all. And couldn't see the, the incoherence there. So, yes, lo love for creation, absolutely. Uh, love for all of creation. You know, so, again, it's getting the, getting the priorities wrong. It's typically, it's typically di diabolical, you know, that we don't put the main things, in the most important things, in the first place. And the first place is always God. Always God. Nothing else. Nothing sub can substitute. Not even your wife wonderful and all as she may be god is still first then your wife then your family and then everything else uh so you know this is sorry this is only one, uh, let this my goodness this could take a while okay the other two are much shorter okay the other two are much shorter so this is the this is the most subtle of the temptations okay because getting priorities wrong he may not actually be, be be tempting you to choose between good and evil he may be tempting tempting you to choose between best and okay you know god's will best and something that's actually it's just okay like for god for jesus to change stones into loaves of bread is that a sin is it a sin no it's it's not a sin i mean he decided to fast for 40 days if he decided to fast for 38 days fair play to him you know if at the end of it he decided to turn those loaves into bread he's still done a 38 day fast if he just did a 10 day fast you know, well done to him. Like, he, does, he doesn't have to do any of this. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, he's not tempting him to sin here, but just to not fulfill his priority, which was to do a 40-day fast, you know, the, the, the 40, 40 years in the desert and our 40 days of Lent. You know, it's all, they're all tied in. So, okay, he's not even tempting him to sin here. Now, okay, second temptation. It gets a little more sinister here. The devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and place him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. 
For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Okay. What's the interesting thing about that temptation? Satan quotes scripture. Now, how sinister is that? Satan actually quotes the Bible. So with this kind of sense of religiosity, he's tempting, he's tempting himself, just throw yourself off the temple. Because it says in scripture, the angels will catch you. Okay? Very, very sinister. It's, it's a hidden kind of a temptation again, because he's using scripture. So it looks, it looks really good. It looks like I'd be actually be fulfilling scripture here. Okay? This is something that we, we spoke about before um, as regards uh, discernment. God wants us to direct our lives. God has given us free will. God has given us an intellect which he wants to inspire, to enlighten, and he's given us a will that he wants to strengthen. So an intellect that we can recognize the truth and a will that we can choose the truth, choose the good. Okay? He doesn't want us to put God to the test and say, well, look, Lord, I'm going to sit at home and do nothing, and then you must provide for me because you are good. That's not God's will. That's definitely not God's will. God always wants us to work with him, not to have him to do the work instead of us. Okay, so he wants us to work with him. So this, this idea of tempting God uh, is not good. And as I say, Satan uses scripture. So even though something may seem scriptural, this is where the, the obedience to the church is so, so important. If someone is even qu quoting scripture, backing up their arguments, if what they're saying is against church teaching, and this is like, this is common also as regards issues like women priests and so on and so forth, people can even quote scripture, but if it's against what the church teaches, they're wrong. They're wrong because it, it doesn't, it's not just enough that you've quoted scripture. There's a whole myriad of things behind it that we can't get into now. Okay, good. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, that's temptation number two. Temptation number three. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Okay, and this last temptation, this is the kind of the, the most serious. This is the most overt this is the ugliest, if you will. I'll give you the world, just worship me. Okay? I will give you the world, just worship me. Now, in our lives, that can, that can, it doesn't, it's not normally quite so blunt or evident. I mean, if you were to see Satan and he were to say, worship me, you'd scream and run. Okay? Because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't show himself, but man, he ugly. All right? So, so he's not going to show himself that way but he'll present himself in different ways. Like, for example, put aside your faith, put aside your morals, and I will make you rich. You know, in your work, in your business, in your relationships, whatever they may be, put morals aside. I will make you powerful, famous, well-known, uh, applause everywhere you go. I'll make you think that you're loved. All right, because you'll, you know, you'll be on the front of newspapers, magazines, internet web pages um, I'll give you success but you give me your soul Satan can do that absolutely that's not a problem and it's very very easy actually these days if you row in with uh, what everyone else is saying what's politically correct and so on and so forth uh, if you cave on your morals for quite some time you'll actually be applauded for it because these days, people don't necessarily want someone to hold a high moral bar. It, you know, we're not kind of like reading about um, couples who've been married for 10 years, and then she had an affair, and he had an affair, and then they both had an affair, and then they got divorced, and then they remarried, and then they got back together, which ended up being an affair. Uh, and, oh, wow. It's kind of fascinating reading, right? But it's, it's, this, is just, this is just not God's will. And interestingly, as well, this is kind of back to the original temptation of Adam and Eve. All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus is God. He already owns the world. Adam and Eve are creating God's image and likeness. And when they're tempted with the fruit, Satan says, Die, you will not die if you eat the fruit, but your eyes will be opened and you will be 
like gods. But they were already created in God's image and likeness. So Satan often tempts us to steal what we already have. That might sound a bit ridiculous, but to steal what, what we already have. Okay, what do, what's the, like the most fundamental desire that all of us have? To love and to be loved. You want to love, you want someone to love, you, know, you want to be able to kind of show your affection, not necessarily, you know, we have all different love languages, but you want to be able to love someone. Okay, you want someone that you can care for, whether it be through your words of affirmation, you want someone to give gifts to, you want someone to hug, you want someone to, to spend time with. Okay, so we want to love, and we also want to be loved. We want to be told, well done. You're important. You're necessary. You make a difference. You want to be told, you're beautiful. You're loved. I miss you. You know, we, we want to hear those words. Okay? So, there are people in our lives who will provide, the Lord will provide people in our lives who will, who will, who will do that for us. Okay? Now, they may not be necessarily masses of people. I wouldn't want it to be anyway. Huge numbers of people who say, oh, you're absolutely amazing, you're fantastic, you're wonderful, so what? I mean, unless there are a few people who actually care and love you for who you are, crowds of people applauding makes absolutely no difference. Because crowds of people don't know you. The few people close to you, they know you. And if, if they don't love you, that's, that, that's, that's very difficult. But the Lord will provide people in your lives, maybe family, maybe friends, but there will be people who will know you and love you. And to have the whole world bow down before you, to own the whole world, will not make any difference to you unless you are loved, unless you have someone to love. And that we do have. We always have people that we can love. Always, because all of you are surrounded by people. So we always have people we can love. And if we're attentive to it, we always have not a huge number, but a sufficient number of people who love us. So we don't need to go stealing it. We don't need to go stealing love. We don't need to go stealing affection. We don't need to go try and rule the world so that we'll be wanted and loved. You already have it. You already have it. Don't go stealing it. You don't need it. And it's so tragic as well when you, when you read the, the lives of the rich and the famous and some of these stars and how, how their stars, as stars, how they fell and how their careers were in boom, absolutely mega famous throughout the whole world and then drug addiction, suicide and so on and so forth. You don't need to tell me the story. You don't need to tell me ye the stories. So applause from crowds makes no difference. Owning the world makes no difference. Being loved, that's what counts. All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And after this, the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. So we pray for each one of us, for all of you in your, in your temptations, in our, in our difficulties, in our challenges, in all these situations where we feel, my goodness, I just, I'm so short of the mark, or I'm so off where I should be. We ask for the Lord's angels to console us too in our battles, that we might always recognize and put into right, the right order our priorities. Putting God in the first place, then our family, then everyone else. That we might never put the Lord to the test, expecting him to do what he has entrusted to us. And that we might never seek love, affection, wealth, power, in places that are just unnecessary, unsatisfying. But that we might open our eyes to the sources of love, in our lives and to the people that we can love in our lives today. Amen.